Greetings, Disciples of Dread and Thrill Seekers, and prepare yourselves for Episode 2 of David Opegard's bone-chilling saga, Clawheart Mountain. I'm Gabe, and I'll be your guide through this shadowy tale, and you've now entered the spine-tingling world of Camcat Unwrapped. In the latest episode of Clawheart Mountain, our unsuspecting group, led by Nova, set foot on Clawheart Mountain, expecting nothing more than a fun-filled vacation. But we, the omniscient spectators, know there's much more lurking in the shadows, don't we? They stumble upon an abandoned armored van, a chest containing millions of dollars. Who could resist the temptation, right? Unbeknownst to them, they've now placed themselves in the crosshairs of not only the relentless police force, but also a ruthless, hired killer, all scrambling to reclaim the lost fortune. And let's not forget, their chosen vacation spot is as creepy as they come. Remember that eerie shadow Nova encountered in the woods? Well, hold on to your hats, because we're about to dive headfirst into that mystery. Eight. Clawheart Mountain was more formidable than Bannock expected. From what little he'd heard about it, Bannock had anticipated a dumpy little plains mountain. Nothing remarkable, but Clawheart had a decent size to it. Its summit elevation must have been somewhere above 9,000 feet. The descending sun cast a rosy light on the mountain's bluish-green mass as they approached it from the west, lending it a hazy watercolor aura, like a mountain in a Turner painting. As they reached the base of the mountain, Bannock felt his spirits begin to rise. His driver, Gideon, had not spoken since they'd left the suburbs of Salt Lake City, even when they'd stopped for gas an hour earlier. The GPS signal went dark on the other side of the mountain, Gideon said, breaking their shared silence. His voice was flat, devoid of any discernible accent or emotion. A thin, pale young man dressed in a cheap gray suit and black wingtips, Gideon reminded Bannock of an old-fashioned Bible salesman. The strange, unblinking kind that made you wince when you saw them standing on your doorstep. The drivers. Two Russians, clean records, loyal, been with the organization for 15 years. What were they driving? Box truck. Gideon shook his head. Armored van. Bannock nodded, picturing an armored van chugging up the same mountain road they were currently climbing. It would be a hell of a struggle for such a heavy vehicle. It must have been hauling a significant amount. Fifteen million? Yes, I'd call that significant. They kept climbing. They passed a paved road labeled Hollow Drive. Five minutes later, they passed through a town named Cloud Vista that was trying too hard to look picturesque and play mountain cowboy. Though the bare arrowhead-shaped peak rising above it was impressive in a time-worn way, even the encroachment of humans couldn't lessen. Gideon drove through town slowly. Bannock noted a diner directly off the highway and filed this information away for later, in case they passed through town again. As he scanned the passing buildings, an image of the rooftop sniper slipped into Bannock's thoughts. He'd left his carved-up body on the roof, along with the sniper rifle, for the locals to sort out. Bannock wouldn't be returning to Utah anytime soon and was untraceable through his Cottonwood Heights residence. It would be time to find a new residence when his current job was over. Somewhere more easily defended and harder to find. Maybe abroad, somewhere warm where the American dollar still went a long way. They put the town behind them, heading down the eastern side of the mountain, passing a sign for a ski resort called the Sunshine Lodge as the road transformed into a narrow switchback. Gideon drove smoothly, but Bannock's stomach, which had gotten more sensitive as he aged, still lurched with every curve. Bannock kept his eyes straight ahead, resisting the urge to look past Gideon at the expansive vista that had opened before them. He noticed a large carcass on the side of the road and felt a sense of relief, it would give him a reason to stretch his legs and calm his churning stomach. Stop the car. Gideon slowed the car and pulled over. The mountain highway had a thin gravel shoulder cut into the right side of the switchback. 
When Bannock opened his door, it brushed against the mountain itself. He got out of the car and shut the door behind him. He crossed the highway, which appeared deserted in both directions and felt as lonely as any road in the world. He stood over the carcass and considered its broken body. It was a bull elk, a lovely beast. Magnificent, really. Its antlers fully grown at the end of the summer, nearly four feet each, their velvet growth coat shed. Why was it up here on Clawheart Mountain? Had it been coming down the mountain or going up? It was mid-August, mating season for elk. It should have been searching for herds of cow elk to rut with, not wandering around lost on a mountain highway, waiting to get hit. The elk had obviously been struck by a vehicle going fast, something big, like their missing armored van. But it hadn't been struck in this spot. A trail of blood ran thirty feet farther up the road. A tough beast, indeed to rise again with such wounds, even for a short time. Bannock couldn't help admiring it. He reached down, grabbed one of the tines dangling from the elk's broken antlers, and snapped it off. Bannock sniffed the tine and put it in his mouth, biting down. He could taste the elk's fear, pain, and confusion. He could taste the final moments of its life. Bannock put the tine in his jacket pocket and followed the elk's blood trail up the highway to its termination point. He squatted and examined the ground. Broken glass, fragments of metal, some additional blood and fluids. Judging from the trampled vegetation, the elk must have been thrown one direction into the switchback wall while the vehicle that had struck it had clearly gone the other way, rolling down the mountainside. Even in the fading light, it was past nine now, Bannock could make out the path of broken vegetation leading down to a lower section of the switchback highway. However, no demolished vehicle was resting on the highway below, armored van or otherwise, though a sheriff's county SUV was parked in the general area. The cruiser's blue and red lights flashed silently, without additional signs of activity. The damaged van had already been towed. The officer or officers in the parked SUV were likely finishing up their paperwork and getting ready to leave as well. Even two dead men, if the drivers were dead, and fifteen million dollars couldn't be granted infinite police time and resources. Everything had undoubtedly been hauled back to the nearest police department for the night. Bannock walked back to the car and slid into the passenger seat. They hit an elk, Bannock said, buckling a seatbelt. Their van rolled down the mountain and crashed on the stretch of highway below us. That's when the signal was lost. Gideon looked through his side window, imagining the scene. Bad luck, then. No disloyalty, no enemy ambush. Bannock shrugged. Maybe. Maybe not. Gideon rubbed the side of his smooth face. What should we do now? There's a police cruiser down there right now, finishing up with the scene. The van's already been towed. I assume the Russians have been taken either to the local jail or morgue. Likely the morgue, considering how far they fell. Gideon thought a moment. Not Cloud Vista. Too small for a morgue. Scorpion Creek, maybe. Twenty miles east. Bannock nodded, thinking about how this development would complicate extracting the money. Gideon put the car in drive and they continued down the mountain. Bannock pictured the accident sight in his mind and saw the elk suddenly bursting onto the highway, giving the armored van's driver little time to react. Maybe the elk hadn't been wandering aimlessly down the road, but instead had been flushed out, pursued by a predator looking for lunch. The elk had been good-sized and filled with fighting spirit. Whatever had chased it into traffic would have been big and nasty. They passed the Sheriff County's cruiser, continuing down the mountain and onto the plains. Gideon took his cell phone out of his suit pocket. He hadn't been able to get cell service on the mountain, and Bannock could tell it had been making him uneasy. The men Gideon worked for didn't like it when their underlings didn't answer their phones. They kept their dogs on a tight leash. So the local cops have the money now, Gideon said, dropping his phone into his pocket and returning his full attention to driving. Bannock crossed his arms, picturing the array of weapons in the Honda's trunk rattling around in his work bag. He thought of himself as an artist who painted with a broad palette. Don't worry, Bannock said. 
They won't have it for long. Nine. Isaac and Landon had cooked a mountain of spaghetti marinara for dinner. The group sat at the dining room table and dug into their food with gusto. Nova noticed everyone ate their pasta elegantly, twirling it carefully around their forks with a limited amount of slurping and marinara splatter. Say what you wanted about rich kids, but they usually had decent table manners. McKenna had even opened a bottle of red wine she'd brought up from the cabin cellar, because naturally, every rugged mountain cabin had a wine cellar. She'd set a wine glass in front of every plate, but Wyatt and Landon had declined the wine, preferring to pour beer into their wine glasses like true fancy gentlemen. McKenna had dimmed the overhead dining room lights for mood lighting and switched the background music from pop to classical. Light and airy classical music, like Mozart and Chopin. This is kind of weird, Isaac admitted, setting his fork and spoon on his plate. Yeah, Wyatt said. I feel like I'm having dinner with my parents. Nova snorted. Yeah, McKenna's giving off some serious mom vibes. Hey, somebody has to take charge around here. I like classical music, Landon said, twirling spaghetti onto his fork. It makes me feel smart and sophisticated. It makes me feel like falling asleep, Isaac said, yawning. This is the kind of music they play in clinic waiting rooms. Wyatt swirled the beer in his wine glass and held it up for inspection. He took a sip and smacked his lips, making little popping bubble noises. A fine vintage. Pale ale, I believe. Landon grabbed his own beer-filled wine glass and sipped from it extending his pinky as if he were drinking tea at an English garden party. Yes, sir, I do believe it is a fine vintage indeed. McKenna slapped Landon's shoulder and he spilled some beer on the white tablecloth. Landon's eyes widened in mock outrage and everyone laughed. McKenna sat back in her chair and crossed her legs beneath her. You guys laugh, but everyone at this table is a multimillionaire now. You'll need to know your wines and champagnes. Nova rolled her eyes and rolled more pasta onto her fork. You think they'll have a lot of champagne at the bonfire tonight? Oh, yeah, Isaac said. I'm sure the mountain folk will have all kinds of reds and whites, maybe even a rosé. Are we really going to this hillbilly party? Wyatt asked, burping and pounding his chest. I mean... Have they ever met a black person before? I don't want some mountain blowout turning into a drunken lynching. Jesus, dude, Landon said, tossing back the rest of his beer. What? It's an honest question. You'll be fine, Wyatt, McKenna said, reaching across the table and squeezing his hand. Everyone is totally cool around here. Cloud Vista is a tourist town. They're used to visitors from all over the world. Yeah, to go skiing. That's a white people sport. Nova grinned. She loved it when people messed with McKenna. She was always so worried about being an ally to everybody and overcoming her white privilege that she was the world's easiest guilt target. Don't be ridiculous, Wyatt. The cabin's doorbell chimed, cutting McKenna off. Everyone looked at the dining room doorway, which led to the living room, which led to the front hall. The mood in the room immediately grew tight. McKenna shook her head, as if rebooting her thoughts, and slowly stood up, pushing her chair back from the table. It's probably Colton again, McKenna said, sounding uncertain. Maybe he's double-checking to make sure we come to the party. Nobody said anything. When McKenna went to answer the door, Nova stood up and followed her into the living room. Nova knelt on a couch and peeked through the blinds. An SUV was parked outside, its headlights bright and focused on the cabin. Cops. Nova dropped the blinds back into place, worried that she'd been seen peeking. The three dudes entered the living room behind her. Nova waved them back toward the kitchen, but they looked at her with blank confusion, which made her feel even more agitated. 
It's the police, Nova hissed. Go back. Understanding dawned in their eyes. First Wyatt, then Isaac, then Landon. And Wyatt herded everyone back into the dining room. Nova stayed on the couch, out of sight from the front hall, but within listening distance through the hall doorway. She heard McKenna whisper, Oh, shit, as she undoubtedly saw who was waiting on her doorstep. Nova heard the bolt lock turning and the door opening with a whoosh. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Deputy Serrano. I'm with the Scorpion County Sheriff's Department. Are your parents home? It was a female cop with a slight accent. Maybe Mexican-American? Was Serrano a Mexican last name? No, McKenna said, but I'm 19 and this is my family's cabin. Nobody spoke for a moment. Nova pictured the police officer looking McKenna over, trying to decide if she was telling the truth. Your name? McKenna Wolcott. Another pause. Nova imagined the deputy writing McKenna's name in a little notebook, like the police did on TV. Miss Wolcott, your neighbors told me you arrived on the mountain today with some friends. Is that correct? Yes. What time would you say you arrived? I don't know. Like four o'clock, maybe? I wasn't paying close attention. Did you see any accidents on your way up the mountain? Like car accidents, you mean? Yes. A brief pause, as if McKenna was really thinking about it. No, I don't think so. You didn't see an overturned vehicle on Highway 72, near the bottom of the mountain? A sky-blue armored van with California license plates. Um, no. I would have definitely remembered something like that. It was a smooth lie. If Nova hadn't known better, she would have thought her friend was telling the truth. All right. Deputy Serrano said, her voice neutral and weary. We're letting everyone in the area know there was an accident earlier today on Highway 72. The vehicle's occupants haven't been located. They could possibly be armed and dangerous, so please exercise extra caution for the next few days. Lock your doors and windows, even during the daytime. Don't go out alone. Call 911 if you happen to see any suspicious persons. Okay, wow, I will, officer, I promise. Have a good evening. Thanks. You too. The door whooshed shut again, and the bolt lock turned. McKenna came into the living room and looked at Nova with wide eyes. The dudes joined them, a look of panic on their faces. Outside, the police car turned around in the yard and drove away from the cabin, its engine rumbling. We need to hide the money. McKenna said, her voice unsteady. We need to hide it, like right now. Everyone put on their coats and brought their share of cash down to the living room. Nova had talked McKenna into lending her one of her big rolling shell suitcases so she could condense all her money into one piece of luggage and ditch the plastic bag. Now the armored van money was divided five ways into three rolling suitcases and two fat duffel bags. The presence of the overstuffed luggage dominated the room, pulling at everyone as if it emitted its own gravity field. Do you really think we need to do this? Landon asked, zipping up his parka. Maybe you're being paranoid, Mac. McKenna shook her head. She'd put on a pink wool beanie, but her wavy blonde hair still spilled down to her shoulders. Nova, who hadn't had long hair since middle school, was starting to miss it after spending an entire day around McKenna. You could only do so much with a pixie cut, which was both its greatest strength and weakness. What if that cop comes back? McKenna said. What if she comes back tonight with a search warrant for the house? Why would she? Isaac asked. Nobody saw us take the money. Nova crossed her arms. Are you completely sure about that? 100% totally sure? Um, I guess not. What about camera drones? Nova said, feeling herself getting worked up again. What about random people hiking on the mountain? The cops said they still haven't found the van's driver, Wyatt said, 
his voice low and uneasy. What if the driver was watching us? He would have said something, Landon said, nudging one of the bags with his toe, his hands crammed into his jacket pockets. Right? I mean, why would you let anybody take your money like that? Plus, he would have been hurt. He would have shouted for help. Nobody said anything. Nova imagined some poor guy with a broken leg or a broken arm or a bloody head. She pictured him lying among the trees somewhere farther up the mountain, watching their group take load after load of cash to their SUV. Maybe he had a punctured lung and couldn't shout. Maybe he had a concussion and couldn't understand what he was seeing. Maybe he had amnesia. Wyatt leaned over and put his hands on his knees. I think I might be having a panic attack. Don't even start, bro, Isaac said, shaking his head. If you have an attack, I'm definitely going to have an attack. Nobody's having any attacks, McKenna said, grabbing one of the rolling luggage pieces by the handle. We just need to hide this shit for a couple of days until everything calms down. This is just a precaution. Nova looked at her phone. It was 10.30. She felt exhausted, and they hadn't even started hiking yet. And you really still want to go to the party? McKenna blinked in surprise, like the thought of not going had never even occurred to her. Heck yeah! After today, we deserve to relax. We deserve to celebrate. Landon cupped his hands around his mouth and whooped. Isaac and Wyatt smiled and whooped back. Everyone grabbed a piece of luggage and together they headed out into the night, bundled up like kids stepping into a snowstorm. 10. The Scorpion Creek Police Station was on the west edge of town. It was right off the highway, wedged between a strip mall and a snowmobile dealership. Every building other than the police station was dark, Every 20 or 30 minutes, a vehicle passed on the highway, going one way or the other. The only vehicles parked in the station's lot were one oversized truck and two sheriff deputies' cruisers. Bannock and Gideon were parked next door to the police station, in the snowmobile dealership parking lot, their car partially obscured by a mass of snowmobiles parked on the dealership's front lawn. They'd been on stakeout for two hours, monitoring the lack of action outside the station. If its interior lights hadn't been on, you might have thought the station was locked up for the night. The whole scene was small-town quiet, which was either peaceful or unsettling, depending on your state of mind. What's the population of Scorpion Creek? Bannock asked, tapping the elk's tine against the car's dashboard. Gideon fiddled with his cell phone. 3,239. Too small for its own comm center. Indeed. Gideon said, his head bobbing in the ghostly light of his phone. County dispatch has run through Rollins. That's a ways off. Wyoming is a big, sparsely populated state. Bannock yawned. What are the station's normal hours? 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays. Sheriff is named Carson. He looks like he's lifted some weights but never been to war. Have you ever been to war, Gideon? Gideon smirked. No, sir, I have not. I prefer to make money. Bannock glanced at the digital clock on the Honda's dashboard. It was 10.42. They should have closed by now. Gideon nodded. As if summoned by their discussion, a skinny male sheriff's deputy emerged from the station's entrance and got into one of the parked SUVs. The deputy didn't look nervous or alert, just tired and ready to enjoy the rest of his Friday night. If there was $15 million locked in the police station, he didn't know about it. Which meant either the money wasn't here, or Sheriff Carson was playing his cards close to the vest. Maybe the old boy had discovered the accident himself. The deputy drove away. Nobody else exited the building, and the station's interior lights remained on. Bannock could sense more people inside the building. It was like a hum in the air. Perhaps they were counting the money. It would take them all night. I'll be back in a few minutes, Bannock said, opening his door. 
Gideon looked up from his phone. The younger man looked remarkably pale, his already intrinsic paleness doubled by the cell phone's white light. He reminded Bannock of a cephalopod, creeping across the impenetrable darkness of an ocean trench floor. Do you need any help? Bannock stared at Gideon and slipped the antler tine back into his jacket pocket, wondering if Gideon was the kind of man who enjoyed molesting small children and causing them pain. He was getting that clammy, scrabbling kind of feeling from him. It was something to file away in the back of his mind, a trait that could either be troublesome or useful, depending on the situation. Just pop the trunk, Bannock ordered. Bannock grabbed his duffel bag from the Honda's truck and walked behind the snowmobile dealership, where he attained a full view of the rear of the police station. He saw a metal door, a security camera, and a smashed-up sky-blue armored van that looked like it had fallen from the sky and landed right there in the station's back parking lot. Painted on the side of the van was the name Steel Cage Armored Services. So, their guesswork had been right. The evidence from the accident site had been hauled back to Scorpion Creek, at least for the night. The sheriff would have contacted the DEA about finding $15 million in laundered money, if he'd contacted anyone at all. But it would have already been late on a Friday evening, and, as Gideon had said, Wyoming was a big, sparsely populated state, and reinforcements hadn't arrived yet. Bannock set his bag on an industrial air conditioning unit and unzipped it. He stuck his combat knife into his belt and opened the carrying case for his recurve takedown bow. The case could be slung over his shoulder by a strap and contained 12 30-inch carbon arrows, a plastic tube-shaped quiver, a bow stringer, an archery glove, a leather arm guard, and an extra bow string. When fully assembled and strung, the bow had a right-hand draw weight of 55 pounds and could send an arrow through just about anything made of flesh. Bannock had been hunting with it for 20 years, gradually replacing its limbs when better materials and designs came along, but sticking with the same polished U-riser, which had brought him much luck over the years. Bannock assembled the bow, strung it, and notched an arrow. He strapped the tube-shaped quiver across his chest, the tubes opening within easy reaching distance. He left his bag on the air conditioning unit and began walking toward the police station next door. He glanced to his left and observed the pale outline of Gideon watching him from the car. Bannock walked smoothly, minding his breath, and came around the side of the police station, holding the recurve bow casually at his side. He noted a second security camera monitoring the building's entrance. He peered inside the station's large highway-facing windows and saw what appeared to be a bullpen area with several desks and office chairs. A lone sheriff's deputy sat behind a desk about twenty feet inside the building. His body turned sidelong to the entrance as he worked on his computer. The rest of the bullpen appeared empty. Bannock tried the station's front door. He was betting it was unlocked, wagering on the confidence and complacency of an isolated small-town police station. And he was correct. He passed through a short airlock entryway and opened a second door. The deputy turned to look at Bannock as he entered the station. The deputy was young, maybe 25, his face pitted with acne scars and his eyes glazed from staring at a computer monitor. Can I help you? Bannock brought the bow up from his side into firing position and drew the bowstring back until it was at full tension. The deputy's eyes widened and he stood up, his hand falling to his sidearm, which was still buttoned securely into its holster per carrying procedure. Bannock took a deep breath, unhurried, and sighted his target. The deputy fumbled with a snap on his holster, sputtering something that sounded like, Stop! Bannock exhaled and released the bowstring, sending the notched arrow flying through the air, its fletching rippling with lethal intent. The arrow struck the deputy in the chest as he struggled to draw his weapon. He fell back on the floor with a loud gasp, as if he'd been punched in the stomach and the light faded from his eyes as he stared at Bannock, a shocked expression on his face. Bannock drew another arrow and notched it as he continued through the bullpen, scanning the empty desks for additional movement. He walked down a middle hallway that led to another hallway. The station was laid out like a capital I. 
Bannock discovered the evidence locker on his immediate left, but it was locked, protected by a formidable blast door with a keypad lock. Bannock went the opposite direction down the back hallway until he reached a doorway with the nameplate Sheriff Carson beside it. The door to the office was open. Bannock could hear the soft plastic clacking of keyboard typing inside and smelled a mixture of stale coffee and microwaved burrito. He drew the string of his bow to full tension and stepped into the office doorway. As he expected, the good sheriff was sitting behind his desk, likely typing up a report that pertained to finding an overturned armored van with $15 million inside. Bannock, going with statistics, shot Carson in the right shoulder first so he couldn't draw his weapon. Then Bannock reloaded and shot Carson in the left shoulder, making it a pair. The sheriff was a nice, wide target, shaped like a rectangular pincushion. He bellowed something unintelligible and stood up behind his desk, his arms hanging useless at his sides. He came around the desk and lowered his big head, trying to bull rush Bannock. Bannock stepped back and stuck his leg out as the big man charged. The sheriff, blinded by pain and rage, tripped over Bannock's leg and fell hard into the hallway, unable to brace his fall as he dropped face first. Bannock set his bow against the wall and unsheathed his knife. He stepped into the hallway and kicked the sheriff in the side as the big man tried to roll over, knocking the wind out of him. Hello, sheriff. Bannock knelt down and grabbed the sheriff by his hair. He pulled the sheriff's head back until his throat was nicely exposed and held the knife's blade against it. The sheriff ceased his struggling and went still. I'm going to need to retrieve something from the evidence locker. Do you think you can help me with that? The sheriff swallowed, his Adam's apple brushing against the knife's blade. Bannock could tell he wanted to say something big and brave. But there it was, that knife at his throat. Eleven. They took one of the wooded trails connecting the homes on Hollow Drive. McKenna led the way with a flashlight, while Wyatt brought up the rear with a second flashlight he kept aimed at the ground. The trail was composed of old wood chips and crushed rocks, and its soft, lumpy surface made it difficult to roll their luggage. Nova envied Wyatt and Landon, who had duffel bags and didn't need to roll anything. She thought about asking them to swap with her for a while, but her usual sense of stubborn pride rose, scorning help from anyone, even though her arms had begun to ache like they might break and fall off. Nova, who'd spent a lifetime as a shorty, was tired of boys asking if they could carry things for her, if she needed help reaching something, or opening a jar, or if she could see the stage at a concert. Her first and only boyfriend, Tennyson, had been only five feet ten, which was a regular height for a dude, sure, but he practically towered over her when they hugged or danced. The longer they dated, the more Nova suspected Tennyson got off on being so much taller than she was, as if he had a sexist power thing going on in the back of his mind, bubbling like an ingrained dude cauldron. He also liked to be right all the time and was hyper-competitive about everything, from grades to Scrabble to social media. Arguing with him often felt like going to war. On the other hand, Tennyson had been cute, with a great smile, and when he actually tried, he could make you feel like you were the only girl in the world, that he loved you so much he could hardly even stand it. Also, he was named Tennyson, after Alfred Lord Tennyson, one of the greatest romantic poets in history. And she couldn't deny that he was a good kisser, gentle with his hands and not too pushy. After six months of making him wait, Nova had finally given in and had sex with him in his bedroom, while his parents were at the movies and his little brother was visiting a friend. They'd listened to chill music, burned a vanilla-scented candle, and used a condom for protection. It had been a little painful for Nova, but it had been nice, too, and they'd cuddled afterward and taken a nap together. Tennyson broke up with her three days later. Over text. This was three months ago, back in May. 
Tennyson had said he was worried they were getting too serious, and he wanted to be free to date other people during his summer internship in London. He'd only texted Nova once since, sending her a picture of Buckingham Palace with three exclamation points beneath it. The whole breakup made Nova feel sad and stupid at the same time. Worst of all, she'd have to see Tennyson again in two weeks, because they were both going to be freshmen at Colorado College, along with two dozen other kids from Pioneer Academy. She still didn't know if she wanted to kill him or get back together. Isaac, who was walking ahead of Nova, tripped over something and staggered forward, dragging his rolling suitcase off its wheels. Fuck me, he swore, struggling to get his suitcase back on track. How far are we going anyway? It's not much farther, McKenna said, glancing back at the line of hikers. Maybe ten minutes? Nova grinned, happy that she wasn't the first one to complain. Hearing somebody else bitch made her arm sockets ache a little less. Hey! Wyatt called out, still at the back of their line. Are there, like, bears on this mountain? Sure, McKenna said. It's a mountain, isn't it? Grizzlies or black bears? Nova asked. Both, I think. Oh, good, Wyatt said, adjusting his duffel bag's shoulder strap. Grizzlies. They won't bother us, Nova said, switching her suitcase dragging arm once again. It's August, and they're getting fat for winter. They're a lot more dangerous in the spring when they're fresh out of hibernation and starving. Unless we surprise them, Landon said. We need to make a lot of noise so they can hear us coming. Great idea, Isaac said, snorting and kicking up a spray of wood chips. Let's make a lot of noise while we're burying stolen money. We didn't steal anything, McKenna said, pushing back a branch. We found it on the side of the road, like collecting litter. Hmm, Nova said, switching arms again with her rolling suitcase. I don't think that'll hold up in court. Whatever, McKenna said, anger flaring into her voice. It's done now. They came to a fork in the trail. McKenna chose the path to the right without slowing down. They'd passed three houses on the trail so far, all higher up on the mountainside. Their lights glowing and warm inviting in the darkness. It had been a while since the last house, though, and the new trail slowly led them downward as they started to loop around the mountain, edging above a dark valley that could have contained anything. Nova was impressed by how unworried McKenna was at the head of their group, pushing on without stopping, rolling her enormous suitcase as if it was empty. She seemed at home on the trail, unfazed by the darkness or the occasional rustling in the surrounding trees. It was a clear night, and the stars were shining bright in the sky. Way more stars than you could see back in Denver, and a crescent silver of a moon gave the woods a diffused silver glow. The temperature had fallen, and it suddenly felt like October instead of August. The air smelled like wood smoke. They came to a massive boulder sitting beside the trail. It looked like an avalanche waiting to happen. Ah, uh, McKenna said, here it is. Now we go off trail. What? Isaac sounded alarmed. McKenna ignored him and tossed her luggage down the mountainside. It crashed and rolled through the weeds. McKenna followed, shining her flashlight on the ground. Everyone stood at the edge of the trail and peered down into the dark trees. Come on, McKenna shouted from the darkness. Throw your bags down too. Aim for my flashlight. You sure, babe? Landon said, frowning as he leaned forward. Yes. Landon looked at the others, shrugged, and tossed down his duffel bag. It landed with a heavy thud somewhere below. Wyatt threw his double bag next, then Isaac. Then it was Nova's turn. She rolled her suitcase to edge of the trail and peered down. 
You want help? Landon asked, stepping up. You want me to chuck it for you? Nova scowled. I can throw it myself, dude. I just don't want to squash your girlfriend. Okay, Landon said, raising his hands in the air. Whatever. Nova picked up the suitcase by its handle and swung it by her side, ignoring the aching flare in her shoulder. She counted. One, two, three, and let the suitcase go, sending it sailing into the dark. It made a satisfying amount of crunching noise as it crashed through branches and rolled down the mountainside. It felt good, Nova thought, throwing so much money away. You all go, Wyatt said, coming up to the edge of the path with the second flashlight. I'll keep the light on the ground so you can see. Nova smirked and wiped her sweaty hands on her jeans. You want us to get eaten by bears first, huh? Wyatt flashed Nova his famous heart-melting smile. I have no clue what you're talking about, Chica. No clue. Nova and the others scrambled down the dark hillside and joined McKenna on a flat, rocky shelf covered in clumps of scrub brush. She'd already recovered their tossed bags and piled them beside a hole in the ground. Everyone gathered around the hole, which was about three feet in circumference, while McKenna pointed her flashlight into it. There's a little room down there. I used to play in it with my sister when we were little. We called it the Cave of Wonders. Landon laughed. Like from Aladdin? Yeah, I so wanted to be Princess Jasmine. She had her own fucking tiger, you know? Wyatt got down on his knees and examined the hole with his own flashlight. Is it safe down there? That looks like a good snake pit to me, Nova said. Actually, I'll be surprised if it's not a snake pit. There's only one way to find out, Isaac said, kicking a loose stone into the opening. Why don't you do the honors, Nova? No thanks, Nova said, folding her arms. I'd prefer to stay alive. We played down there for years, McKenna said, tucking a loose strand of her hair behind her ear. We never saw any snakes. You never know, though, Wyatt said, leaning forward and sticking his head into the opening. Snakes migrate, don't they? Nobody said anything. Nobody knew if snakes migrated or not. What do you see? Landon asked leaning over Wyatt's prone body like he could somehow help him by looking over his shoulder. Wyatt grunted, an elbow crawled back from the opening. Nothing. It looks empty. No snakes? Nova asked, imagining an entire pit of writhing cobras with huge fangs, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. Nah, just some branches and pine cones, shit like that. Wyatt looked up at Nova and offered her the flashlight. You want to see for yourself? Okay. Nova took the flashlight and got down on her knees beside the opening. She looked at McKenna. Hold my ankles, okay? I don't want to fall in. Sure, girl. No problem. McKenna knelt behind Nova and grabbed her ankles while Nova leaned over the opening. She lowered her arms and head into the opening and swept the flashlight back and forth. The Cave of Wonders was smaller than she'd expected, but big enough to feel like a hobbit home for a child, maybe a four-foot drop to the floor. Short enough you could slip inside and climb out again. No beer bottles, graffiti, or other signs of recent human visitation. Only rocks, branches, and pine cones, just like Wyatt had said. Actually, the burrow felt cozy and warmer than the night air above her like a good hiding spot from the world. Nova had once had a little cave like it when she was a kid, in the woods behind their house, before the land had been sold and the entire woodlot was leveled for more houses. It had been a nice, safe place, that cave. She could hide there after school and write in her journal, and nobody would bother her. It had been her fortress of solitude, her refuge. Nova crawled back from the opening and McKenna let go of her ankles. Well, McKenna asked, you satisfied? Nova nodded and stood back up, slapping the dirt from her knees. 
Yeah, thanks for holding my ankles. McKenna smiled. No problem. So are we really going to do this? Isaac said, crossing his arms. Are we really going to drop over $10 million into a hole in the ground and leave it? It's only for a few days, McKenna said. We can come back and get the bags before we leave on Monday. We can always turn the money in, Nova said, blowing warm air into her hands. It's not too late. We could drop the bags somewhere and make an anonymous phone call to the police. They'd never know it was us. Landon laughed. Right. Turn it in after hauling it all over the place? No thanks. I'd rather keep it and be rich. Nova looked at Wyatt and Isaac, hoping for some support. Don't you feel guilty? Like, it's not supposed to be ours. Wyatt shrugged. We deserve it as much as anybody. Maybe I'll donate some to the Red Cross. Yeah, McKenna said, her voice brightening. Let's all donate, like, $10,000 to a charity. Would that make you feel better, Nova? If we all donated some of it, we could give money to Planned Parenthood or something. Nova stared at the bags. Five people times $10,000. $50,000 was a drop in the bucket. $50,000 was hardly anything. What about... My family actually needs the money, Isaac said, interrupting Nova. We're in debt, like major debt. Everyone looked at him as the night wind rustled the trees. Nova could still smell wood smoke on the air. But your dad is a hedge fund manager, isn't he? Landon said, lifting his duffel bag into the air and dropping it again, making it thump. They make serious bank. I know, Isaac said, nodding. He does. He also has a gambling problem. Well, it's more like a drinking and gambling problem. He gets drunk and gambles on stocks, sports, cards, horse racing. He's a gambling fiend. They finally had to fire him last month. My mom says she's going to divorce him. We have to sell our house. Shit, Wyatt said. I'm sorry, man. I had no idea. Isaac's openness surprised Nova. She wondered if the darkness was helping him talk, similar to talking during a sleepover after the lights had been turned off and somebody's mom told everyone to go to sleep. Nova had always liked talking like that when she was younger. Even with girls she hardly knew, laughing and talking about your crushes and feeling so happy and cozy, you wiggled your butt inside a sleeping bag and hugged your pillow. She enjoyed talking with the lights out more than watching movies, or playing dress-up, or the board games, or all the snacks. People were more honest in the dark. You shouldn't give your dad the money, McKenna said, grabbing the handle of her suitcase. He'll just gamble it away. You should, like, figure out a way to hide it from him until he gets help. You know, like Gamblers Anonymous. Yeah, I guess. Don't worry, dude, Landon said, putting his arm around Isaac's shoulder. My family isn't rich either. Our credit cards are, like, totally maxed. My mom's obsessed with looking rich and buying the same crap our neighbors buy. It's fucking ridiculous, man. We get, like, five packages from Amazon every day. She makes sure we all have the newest iPhone the day they come out, even when we don't want the newest iPhone. McKenna made a hissing sound and looked at Nova, her flashlight waving at the ground. It's true. Cassie is a little too into shopping online. All right, Nova said, shrugging. So what? None of this stuff is so bad. You guys will be okay. It's not like you're Ukrainian refugees. McKenna sighed and crossed her arms. We already voted, Nova. Yeah, we did, but that was before the cops showed up. Nobody said anything. Screw it, McKenna said, setting her flashlight down on the ground and lifting her suitcase into the air. I'll go first. Nobody moved to stop her. McKenna swung her hard shell suitcase over the opening and dropped it. 
it landed with a thud inside the hole. McKenna dusted off her hands and picked the flashlight back up. She stepped away from the opening and gestured toward it with the flashlight's beam. Come on, we still have a campfire party to go to. Landon dropped in his duffel bag next. Then Isaac and Wyatt did the same. Nova rolled the hard shell suitcase she'd borrowed from McKenna to the opening and peered into the darkness. This time, nobody asked if she needed help. She rolled the suitcase into the hole and it landed on top of the others. Nova stepped back and Wyatt shined his flashlight into the opening. You could see the dark edge of Nova's suitcase sticking out against the beige-colored rock. Just a little, but it was there. McKenna came forward with an armful of pine branches. She draped them across the opening and arranged the branches so you couldn't see it. There, she said, holding her flashlight to her chin so it made her face glow against the night. Now we're safe. 12. Deputy Serrano drove down Clawheart Mountain headed back toward the Scorpion Creek police station. It was past 11 at night and she was exhausted. She'd spent the last three hours going door to door around Cloud Vista and the surrounding area, asking if anyone had seen the armored van accident or had any details about strangers appearing in the area. She'd encountered the entire gamut of responses, from chatty old ladies to mildly curious to the drunk and sullen. All that legwork and Serrano had accomplished nothing other than starting a town-wide gossip chain. The year-long residents of Cloud Vista lived on a mountain because they liked the isolation and quiet. They didn't like strangers coming around and asking questions. They had big dogs. They had loaded guns mounted above doorways. They had silent children with big, staring eyes that watched you with unnerving intensity. The Old West was still alive and well in Cloud Vista, despite the central heating, pickup trucks, and internet. Serrano had heard more than one rumor about local justice being dished out when someone stepped out of line. Bodies buried on the mountain in unmarked graves dropped into one of the dozens of old mining shafts that perforated Claw Heart. Rival families settling feuds with fists and knives. Abused children running away into the woods, never to be seen again. Beaten women disappearing their husbands, nothing ever proven. Evidence evaporating into thin air, a veil of silence which made any investigation difficult, of course. The missing armored van crew wasn't as baffling as the untouched money. Serrano could see a few enterprising locals knocking off an armored vehicle. But why would they go to so much trouble and not take all of it? One of the defining characteristics about money was that nobody ever seemed to get enough of it especially when it was just sitting there for the taking. Serrano was eager to see the van's security footage, which they'd sent via deputy to the state crime lab in Cheyenne for analysis. Sheriff Carson had called in a favor with a lab tech there, who'd promised to retrieve the footage and get it to them by tomorrow afternoon. Deputy Serrano passed the elk carcass on the side of the mountain highway. It was even uglier and more disturbing in the wash of headlights with several turkey vultures perched on it, tearing it apart strip by strip. She'd already notified Game and Fish about this particularly nasty item of roadkill, but they obviously hadn't gotten to it yet. Sometimes with roadkill, such as elk or moose, you might catch somebody trying to saw off its head and antlers for personal use, either to sell or mount on the wall in their own home. But this elk was so mangled, including its antlers, that so far it appeared untouched by human scavengers. 
Serrano descended the final stretch of Switchback Highway and drove onto the plain toward Scorpion Creek. She felt her shoulders loosen as Clawheart Mountain dropped behind her. And she realized how tense she'd been since finding the armored van earlier that day. Her cell phone buzzed, and she put the call through to the car's stereo. Hey, baby, how's the crime fighting going? Her husband, Miguel, sounded tired. He worked as a grocery store butcher in Scorpion Creek. They had two energetic little boys who loved to run both of them ragged. It's going, Deputy Serrano said. I can promise you that. You going to be home soon? Soonish, probably midnight. I'm heading back from Clawheart and need to swing by the station and check in with the boss man. See if there's anything new and exciting before I hang up my cape for the night. You work so hard, lady. Serrano smiled and squeezed the steering wheel with both hands. You know it, mi amor. How are the boys? Finally in bed. I had to wrestle them away from their PlayStation. I bet you did, my big, strong butcher man. See you soon. I'll try to stay awake. Serrano laughed. Right. Good luck with that. They both knew Miguel would be asleep on his recliner when she got home. A half-finished beer on a side table, and their cat, Mushi, curled in his lap, both of them snoring. Serrano would have to wake him up and lead him upstairs to bed, the cat trailing at their heels, happy to complete this final ritual of their day. Just thinking of home, Serrano drove a little faster. Normally, they locked up the police station at 10 at night and didn't open it again until 8 the next morning. Tonight, however, Sheriff Carson and a deputy would be on duty all night to watch over the money and the armored van. Deputy Serrano parked beside Sheriff Carson's truck in the front parking lot. As soon as she exited her vehicle, an uneasy feeling settled in her gut. The lights were on, but she couldn't see either Deputy Heller or Sheriff Carson inside the station. Serrano pressed the speaker button on her uniform's shoulder mic. Sheriff Carson, you there? No answer. Deputy Heller, you there? Still no answer. Serrano unsnapped her holster and drew her gun proceeding with caution toward the station's entryway. She pushed the exterior door open, which should have been locked but wasn't, and opened the interior door as well, moving forward now as if compelled in a dream. Deputy Heller was lying on the floor in the middle of the station bullpen. His arms were thrown out, like he'd fallen backward with force, and his eyes were open with surprise. His weapon was still in its holster, though the holster was unbuttoned, and he had what looked like the shaft of a fiberglass arrow sticking out of his chest, a clean shot right to the heart. Sweet Mary, Deputy Serrano whispered, a great trembling filling her body. She scanned the rest of the bullpen, saw no additional threats or victims. She knelt and checked the deputy for a pulse. Nothing. Serrano stood and proceeded through the bullpen deeper into the station. The trembling in her body grew worse as she went down the station's central hallway. She could smell the copper of fresh blood and other foul bodily aromas. She turned left at the end of the hallway and saw the back hallway was smeared with a trail of blood that connected the sheriff's office to the evidence locker. The heavy metal door to the evidence locker stood wide open. Deputy Serrano fought a powerful urge to run away as she peered inside the doorway, her weapon still raised. Inside the room was a second body, tied to a chair with nylon rope. Sheriff Carson was obviously dead as well. 
He had an arrow sticking out of each shoulder, as if he'd reached for his gun and been dissuaded. His clothes had been cut away, and his body had been carved up with great skill. Among other things, both his eyes were missing. Their sockets carved hollow with a skillfulness Serrano's husband would have admired. On the metal evidence shelves behind Sheriff Carson was an empty space. The money was gone. 13. They scrambled up the hillside back to the main trail. McKenna promised the overlook was around the bend. Only ten more minutes. Nova's cell phone wasn't getting any reception, but it did tell her it was 12.42 a.m., past midnight, and here they were tromping around a dark mountain, their path illuminated only by two wavering flashlights. Nova's mother would have stroked out if she had known these basic details, not to mention the stolen money they'd just buried in the ground like a bunch of teenage pirates. Nova dreaded the call she'd needed to make tomorrow to check in and prove she was still alive. Her mother would grill her, and she'd have to lie her ass off, something she'd never been good at. Lying always made Nova feel like she'd swallowed a balloon, and the more she lied, the bigger the balloon grew, making her feel bloated and queasy. There, McKenna said, pointing up ahead at a red flickering glow in the distance. See, not too far. Sweet, Landon said. I love bonfires. The dudes had lit a joint and were passing it between themselves, blowing hazy plumes into the cold night air. McKenna and Nova had both declined, but Nova was now reconsidering her decision. Cannabis normally made her sleepy and hungry, but maybe it would be nice to take the edge off and stop worrying so much. Maybe she just needed to relax. People huddled around the fire in puffy coats and stocking caps. McKenna led their group into the clearing, and a boy stood up, tall and broad. It was Colton Morgan, now wearing a green fleece vest and a trucker hat, his freckles like sparks against his pale skin. Nova felt her heart squeeze at seeing him again, which was ridiculous because first, they didn't even know each other. Second, she'd be gone in a few days. And third, he was into McKenna anyway. Hey, Colton said, grinning. You guys made it. Several logs were placed around the pit for seating, along with a half dozen tree stumps, while a pack of stacked deadwood as tall as Nova sat at the edge of the firelight. I was worried you got lost, Colton said, handing McKenna a can of beer. We were about to send out a search party. McKenna cracked open the beer and took a big swig. Nope, we didn't get lost. We just like to be fashionably late. Colton laughed as if this was the funniest thing he'd heard all day before introducing the people sitting around the fire. Nova had expected a larger group, a party kind of crowd, but she counted only six others beside Colton. Three chicks and three dudes, all white all around 18 or 19, all emitting strong mountain towny vibes. One of the dudes had a vape pen, and two of the chicks were smoking cigarettes. Two cases of beer sat on the ground, their cardboard ends ripped open, empty beer cans strewn about. Nova wondered whose older sibling or friend had been willing to buy alcohol for them. Colton handed out beer to the rest of the new arrivals, and everyone sat around the fire, with the townies on one side and their group of suburban kids on the other. It felt very ceremonial and classic, like a scene from the Middle Ages. Two groups of strangers meeting on a dark night to share a fire and libations. Nova opened her beer and a little explosion of foam shot out, covering the back of her hand. She shook her hand to dry it and sipped the foam from the rim of the can. She still wasn't too excited about the taste of beer, but she was thirsty from all the hiking. Colton raised his beer in the air. Hey, he said, winking at Nova. Welcome to the Overlook.
Everyone drank watching the fire in silence. You could see a bed of white hot coals at the base, each coal glowing like a miniature sun. Nova leaned closer and closed her eyes, enjoying the warmth. She listened as the wind rustled the trees and the wood crackled in the fire. She felt relaxed for the first time since leaving her house that morning. Did the cops visit you guys too? Nova opened her eyes. She did her best to keep her face blank and expressionless. Smoke swirled around her, making the night hazy. Yeah, McKenna said, sounding fake casual. A lady cop stopped by and asked us if we'd seen a car crash when we were driving up the mountain. I told her no. We would have remembered something like that, right? The locals nodded from across the fire. Colton took a sip of beer and belched. Weird how they couldn't find the driver, right? You think they'd be smashed all over the place if they crashed going down the mountain. My cousin Andy died going down that switchback, one of the local girls said, blowing a plume of cigarette smoke from the side of her mouth. It was January, and the road was coated with black ice. He lost control for a second, and that was all it took. Boom. Down the mountain. They had to chisel him out of the highway. Fuck, Landon said, taking a long toke on his joint. That's gruesome. The girl nodded. The other locals didn't look particularly horrified. They'd all heard the story before, probably a hundred times. People disappear around here, one of the local dudes said. Happens all the time. Shit, not this again, Colton said, sighing and crumpling his can of beer in his hand. You and your lame ghost stories, Max. Max didn't say anything. He stared into the flames and their flickering light reflected in his eyes. He didn't seem drunk or stoned, just locked into the fire. What story? Nova asked. What do you mean? Yeah, Wyatt said. Tell us, dude. I love ghost stories. Max looked across the fire directly at Nova. She returned his gaze, not flinching. She felt the night fold in around them, as if there was only this fire now, with these twelve people sitting around it. Back in 1850, Max began, a small wagon train of settlers headed for California decided to cross Claw Heart Mountain instead of taking the South Pass farther north. This was back in the gold rush days, right? The settlers were hoping they'd strike it rich on the mountain and show up in California already loaded with gold. Nova shifted on her seat, turning over the phrase, strike it rich, in her mind. She pictured their cache of suitcases, hidden not that far away. Clawheart was still wild back then, with only one old fur merchant trail running over it. No forts or towns, just pine trees, bears, and streams packed with cutthroat trout. The settlers made their way up the old merchant trail and reached the valley where Cloud Vista is now. They panned for gold. After a couple of months, they found a decent vein. The settlers built a few log cabins, spent the winter on the mountain, and cleaned the deposit out by the following summer. Nova glanced at McKenna. She was all cuddled up against Landon, drinking her beer and smiling like she knew a secret. Maybe a dirty one. The firelight made her blonde hair glow beneath her ski cap, each strand catching the light. Even bundled up against the cold, she looked beautiful, her cheeks rosy with health. Everybody was happy with the find, except this one old Indian fighter named Reginald Sutton. Sutton had been hired by the settlers to protect them, but he mostly drank and practiced throwing his knife into trees. He was an angry, greedy asshole. The night before they headed down the mountain, Sutton decided to kill all the settlers and keep the gold for himself. Max poked at the fire with a stick. A white hot log collapsed into the bonfire's embers, causing Nova to flinch on her tree stump. It was a cloudy night. You couldn't see anything once your fire went out. 
Sutton crept into each cabin in camp and slit everyone's throat while they slept. Men, women, children. He even carved up the babies before they could even start to cry. Wyatt whistled softly, and one of the townie girls gave a nervous laugh. Nova shivered, imagining Sutton creeping through the night with his knife. She pictured him with a crooked spine and a face covered in old scars. He might be hanging out at the overlook with them right now, standing just beyond the reach of the firelight. He could be waiting to drag somebody into the trees. In the last cabin in camp was an old Spanish witch, Max continued. The witch had come on the journey because she wanted to see the Pacific Ocean before she died. When Sutton stabbed her in the heart, robbing her of her final wish, the witch cursed him with her dying breath, which makes any curse even stronger. Max looked around the fire, his dark eyes daring anyone to challenge this claim. No one did. At first, nothing happened. Sutton loaded all the gold and some supplies into one wagon. He left the valley where they'd made camp and headed down the mountain. A few hours later, Sutton felt a pain in his stomach. At first, he tried to ignore it, but the pain grew so bad he couldn't sit on the wagon anymore. He jumped down and lay on the ground. It felt like his insides were eating themselves. The pain was so bad he passed out, right there on the trail, with his horses still hitched. Dude was fucked up, huh? One of the towny boys said, which made a couple of the girls laugh and rustle in their chairs. Max ignored them. When Sutton woke up, he could tell something had changed. He didn't feel right. He felt warm, even though it was a cold mountain night. His clothes lay in shreds on the ground. When he looked down, he saw his body was covered in fur, and his fingers had turned into claws. He found a pool of water and looked at his reflection in the moonlight. He wasn't human anymore. He turned into some kind of beast. Max leaned back from the fire and took a swig of beer. Everyone, including the townies, was staring into the bonfire as if it was a movie screen, transfixed by what they saw there. Nova wanted to have this power as a poet, to cast a spell with her words, to make everyone grow so quiet you could hear embers popping in a fire. Sutton was hungry now, Max continued, hungrier than he'd ever been in his life. He ate all the rations in his wagon, but he was still hungry. He killed a deer and ate the whole carcass, but he was still hungry. No matter how much he ate, Sutton was always hungry, always in pain. The best he could manage to do was gorge himself, burrow deep into the mountain, and hibernate. Max swallowed and locked eyes with Nova. She could see tiny reflected dots of firelight in his pupils. The witch had also cursed Sutton with immortality, so he would have to suffer forever. He became a wraith. The wraith. He became the hunger in the mountain. Max fell silent. His tale ended. Released from the story's dream web, everyone started talking and laughing again. Their faces flushed in the firelight. Unwilling to have the ghost story quickly dismissed by doubters, Nova got up and walked away from the bonfire. Above the overlook, the stars were out in all their glory, dazzling and abundant. Nova checked her cell phone, a glowing square in the darkness. She had a few bars now. She felt a strong urge to call her mother and tell her everything about the trip, confess to stealing the money. But it was too late at night, and she could already feel the words sticking in her throat. Nova slipped her phone into her pocket. She looked up at the stars, so bright and multitudinous until somebody called her name, releasing her from her reverie. Nova stumbled back to the crackling fire, glad for the heat and the light. She was glad she was not alone. 
14. Bannock sat on a backyard patio in the blue light of pre-dawn, facing east as he drank coffee and waited for sunrise. He'd only slept three hours, but that was enough. He could feel the recent killings humming in his blood, stirring up the old wartime energies. He'd enjoyed attacking the police station in Scorpion Creek, the same way an athlete enjoys returning to the field after coming out of retirement. A charged moment before the game begins, the roar of blood in your ears, the pounding of your heart, and that first beautiful moment when your opponent becomes aware of your intentions and desperately tries to counter them, only to fail and fall upon the field of battle. Bannock had missed the killing. He'd buried a part of himself during his self-imposed semi-retirement in Utah. Perhaps the worthiest part of himself. The part closest to the gods and the ancient ways. The part developed and honed in the mud and the cold of his ancestors' brutal lives. Thousands upon thousands of years of killing and survival. The part so many men of this time had forgotten and ignored in favor of comfort and safety. Bannock's true nature had lain dormant, sleeping while he dwelled in his cozy home. But it was all coming back to him now. A bat fluttered past Bannock on the patio, likely heading home for the day. The air smelled like cow shit and sagebrush, wet with morning dew. Bannock and Gideon were visiting a ranch two hours northwest of Clawheart Mountain. They'd chosen the ranch at random, looking for an isolated location to hide out while waiting for further instructions from the organization. They discovered a few surprising things during their visit to the Scorpion Creek Police Department that required further digestion. They'd found only a third of the shipment of cash they'd been sent to retrieve. The rest was mysteriously missing. No matter how much Bannock had carved into the local sheriff, the gentleman had been unable to provide Bannock with additional information. Also curious was the armored van's missing crew. Bannock had assumed the two men would either be in the morgue or the county hospital, but the sheriff had informed Bannock that they'd been absent from the scene, which led to all sorts of intriguing suppositions, such as the crew had been ambushed by a rival operation, who left the dead elk on the side of the road as a red herring. For whatever reason, the rival operations crew had only taken two-thirds of the cash delivery, perhaps as an additional red herring, or due to unforeseen operational complications. Though it was hard to imagine what would induce anyone to abandon five million dollars ripe for the taking. The crew had set up the entire accident themselves. The dead elk, the armored van rolling down the mountainside, the mysteriously abandoned money. All of it had been planned. They'd been satisfied with ten million between them and left the remainder as a smokescreen, perhaps hoping that not taking it all would somehow placate the organization and induce them to call off any ensuing retrieval operations. If this was the case, they were even bigger fools than the usual fools who tried to steal from the organization. The crew had truly been involved in an accident on Clawheart Mountain. Afterward, they'd abandoned the armored van for some reason, perhaps due to shock, disorientation, or fear of the authorities arriving on site. They'd removed ten million from the van's cargo hold, leaving the rest behind due to time or transport constraints. They could still be awaiting help from the organization to extract. The crew had truly been involved in an accident on Clawheart Mountain. They'd either been killed or incapacitated. A third party, likely random, unrelated civilians, had come along soon after and discovered the money in the cargo van's hold. Seeing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, they'd taken both the money and the crew, loading everything up as fast as they could to avoid being discovered on the highway. They'd been forced to leave the remaining cash due to time and or transport constraints. If the van's crew hadn't been dead at the accident scene, they would be now, likely buried in a shallow grave somewhere hundreds of miles from Clawheart Mountain. Bannock hadn't settled on one particular theory yet. He liked to keep an open mind to provide operational flexibility. He'd seen a lot of unlikely things in his life, 
and none of the possible theories seemed that outlandish to him. Money, particularly a great deal of it, had a way of generating chaos in the lives of those who came across it. It was an elemental force, like the wind, the rain, and needed to be considered accordingly. A glass sliding door opened and Gideon stepped onto the patio. Vanek's driver looked relatively fresh despite the long hours of travel they'd put in the day before. His cheap gray suit looked unrumpled and crisp, his powder blue eyes clear and alert. His pale skin glowed in the growing light as if he were a specter come to haunt Bannock for all the considerable wickedness he'd done in his life. He was carrying a pot of coffee in one hand and a cup in the other. He sat beside Bannock on the patio table so he could also look out at the grassy fields delineated by barbed wire fencing. It's not much of a view, but there's a lot of it, Gideon said. Refill? Bannock nodded and Gideon refilled his mug. Gideon's own mug was already filled, nearly to the brim. Gideon set the coffee pot down on the plastic patio table and lifted his mug to his mouth slowly, not wanting to spill on his suit, and took a cautious sip. Bannock waited, allowing the man to speak when he was ready. He could already sense another long day spread out before them. No use in rushing toward it when it would come either way. The organization will pay you one-third of the disgust fee, Gideon said, looking at Bannock through the steam rising above his mug. They feel it is proportional to the retrieval of one-third of their money. Bannock didn't say anything. However, if you are able to retrieve the remaining amount, they are willing to pay the full fee, along with an additional one million dollar bonus. Bannock did the math. The bonus would increase his original fee by 50% netting him three million dollars for a few days' labor. The organization must have been truly worried the remaining cash was in the wind. They had no idea what had happened on Clawheart Mountain. Not a fucking clue. The organization believes the van's crew may be hiding out on the mountain, biding their time until things cool off. They're currently monitoring local police channels and will pass on any useful information. Bannock drank his coffee. It was generic and stale, the kind of coffee old ranchers drank, the kind of pre-ground coffee you bought once a month in bulk when you drove a hundred miles to a proper city. We'll have to go back to the mountain, Bannock said. Today. Gideon nodded. It'll be dangerous after Scorpion Creek, Bannock said. The local cops will be on alert. The DEA will probably be swarming around, too. We erased the police station's security footage and wiped the scene. Nobody knows what we look like. Bannock pictured Clawheart Mountain, which still loomed in his mind. It was a big mountain, bigger than he'd expected. It had also given off an unusual energy, something he couldn't quite discern, something he'd never felt before. We'll need another vehicle. Gideon smiled and blew on his coffee. Our hosts have a pickup truck in the barn. We'll fit right in. Sure, Bannock said, rapping the table with his knuckle. You and that suit you're wearing will blend in perfectly. Gideon looked down at himself. I suppose you're right, he allowed. I could borrow some more casual items from the husband's wardrobe. Bannock visualized their day. The two-hour drive back to the mountain, stopping at that small town. Cloud Vista, trying to poke around while evading suspicion, hunting two dangerous men who may or may not have stolen ten million dollars. He felt his blood warm simply thinking about it, his nerves sparking to attention. What about our hosts? Gideon asked. What should we do about them? Bannock sat back in his chair and looked out across the plains. The sun was finally rising above the horizon in the east, it would be another hot, dry summer day in Wyoming. Earlier that morning, he'd broken into the house, killed the couple's border collie, and subdued the couple before they managed to turn on the bedroom light. The old couple was secured at the moment, mummified by duct tape and squirming in their bed like larvae, likely terrified out of their minds and praying to their maker. We'll throw them in the trunk of your car and drive separately, Bannock said draining the rest of his coffee. Whoever visits the house next will think they're on vacation. 
We'll drive the car into a lake somewhere between here and the mountain. All right. Gideon got up and cleared the table. I'll wipe everything down inside the house and change. Fanick nodded. He stood up and stretched. His back was feeling stiff from all the recent action. He was no longer a young man, that was for certain. But the day was young, and this sunrise sure was beautiful. That specter, the wraith, really sends shivers down the spine, doesn't it? The hunger in the mountain. Oof, I'm practically frozen with dread. Can you feel the chill of terror creeping up your spine too? And with the relentless police force and the deadly Bannock closing in, will our unsuspecting group decide to flee the horrors of Clawheart Mountain before the clock runs out? The answer lies hidden in the shadows of our next episode. So keep your lanterns lit and your courage at hand as we continue our spine-tingling journey through the eerie tales of Clawheart Mountain. Mountain.